Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. We begin today's program with a story from a UVM student who is currently an intern with the university's Center for Research on Vermont. Student Sarah Blow has focused part of her internship on learning about a Vermont author whose book explores the rise and fall of a 19th century family farm. Hi, I'm Sarah Blow, and I recently sat down with Vermont author David Holmes to discuss his new book on being a Vermonter and the rise and fall of the Holmes Farm. We were able to visit the land that was once the historic Holmes Farm located in Charlotte, Vermont. David and I discussed the history of his family's farm and what it means to be a true Vermonter. Uh, it's about the history of a farm that existed in Charlotte from 1822 to 1923, and it happens to have my DNA connected to it because my grandparents and great-grandparents and great-grandparents uh, were a part of the history of the farm, mm -hmm. and uh, it was created in 1822, and the family had come to Vermont in the late 1700s and moved to Moncton and thought that a better place for agriculture would be over in Addison County next to the lake. So they mm -hmm. moved there in 1822, and then build a farm and build an apple orchard and build a horse business and did all the things that go with farming over those 101 years. Uh, so it's really about the uh, the building, the settling of Vermont, the creation of, far of a farm that lived for 101 years and the life and culture of a family that uh, devoted themselves to that, that place for over a century. Yeah, and when did you start um, the research for your book? Uh, it really started about, I hate to say it, about 35 years ago when I happened to be uh, living here and working at UVM. Mm -hmm. And uh, my aunt and my grandparents had kept a lot of the old pictures from the farm and old archives, and they were piled away in dresser drawers. And an aunt of mine uh, said, uh, well, look, let's go look at the old Quaker Cemetery in Moncton where the family was, and let's go down and drive by the old farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I developed a curiosity and heard about the apple orchard, mm -hmm. which became uh, at one point the largest apple orchard in New England, and wanted to learn more about it. And you know, when you do research, you're pleasantly surprised. And I said, well, I wonder if the UVM Special Collections has anything about the orchard. Mm -hmm. And so this was about 1982, as a matter of fact, and went over to Special Collections and they said, well, they might have some things uh, uh, from the State Department of Agriculture and there's something called the, um, there's an Apple Association and uh, you might want to look at that. And I can remember opening up the annual reports of the Vermont Horticultural Association and thumbing through and finding my great grandfather's name Oh, wow. And uh, and thumbed through several volumes and over about 10 or 12 years, the orchard and the uh, point of view and the experience of my grandfather, my great grandfather was featured there. And the thing that was just marvelous was that, that, that the time that he made presentations to the association and elsewhere, they kept verbatim notes. And so you go back for more than 100 years and you hear how your great grandfather yeah. actually talked and the way he thought. Yeah. And that for me was a wonderful piece of doing the research is finding the familiarity mm -hmm. with uh, relatives that lived 100 and 150 years ago. And so you, you didn't go into it thinking, I'm going to write a book. When did that shift? So uh, along the way, I said, well, gee, maybe this is a s substantial enough story that could be a book of interest, mm -hmm. uh, not only to the family, more than a family history, but a Vermont history. And what I discovered very quickly was that there was no previous, what I would call a case study of a Vermont, of a Vermont farm from the early 1800s to the early 1900s. And being a scholar by training, I said, well, maybe I could make a contribution yeah. uh, to uh, the literature on Vermont history. And of course, the tangent of the book is, uh, you know, wanting to understand my family better, mm -hmm. wanting to write a history of Vermont that might be a contribution, be a case study. Uh, but then, of course, reflecting on uh, what it really means to be a Vermonter. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there was some philosophizing that grew out of the, the story itself and the, the scholarship. And, uh, 
you know, any of us that now live in Vermont, are we real Vermonters? And yeah. so that forced me to give a lot of thought because I had lived away most of my life, come back frequently, see my grandparents and my parents, and then eventually moved back here once and for all five years ago. And that's when I said, well, let's take it on. And what was this writing process like? How long did it take? Probably took two and a half years of uh, doing more research and pulling it together and drafting things and figuring out how to how to use the pictures. When I had been uh, at UVM, uh, you know, 30 or 40 years be before that, I had taken the all the pictures and had a professional photographer, actually somebody at UVM, take pictures of the old pictures oh, okay. and create negatives and a contact sheet. But so I'd been carrying around a couple hundred pictures for 30 years. And um, so that became a, a, you know, an easy part to weave into the story mm -hmm. to get a sense of what it really looked like. And of course, you know, all of us are curious about what was life really like and what yeah, was the culture, course. you know, in 1880 mm -hmm. living in Vermont. And uh, so that was part of the curiosity I brought to it. And when this book is out, what do you hope that people who read it will get from it? Well, I think that uh, I'd like to have people understand the... Uh, what it took to be a pioneer and come to Vermont, which was a dense forest with dangerous animals and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there were, uh, you know, battles, you know, battles that went on and uh, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812. And I think it's really, uh, you know, really important to understand that part of our heritage for all of us that uh, now live in, live in Vermont. Then, of course, there's the uh, kind of discussion, the long standing discussion of what it really means to a Vermonter, be a Vermonter, and a Vermonter is different. And I think if there's one thing that distinguishes a Vermonter and it's brought out in the story, it's the love of the land. It's part of who we are, it's part of our psychology, mm -hmm. and that continues to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And so just to wrap up, um, when is your book coming out and where can people find it? Uh, it, I, I think it'll hit the street, so to speak, in late, late October, early November. Okay. And then it'll be in the bookstores. And uh, already there are some reviews of the book that will probably take place in Digger and Seven Days and some other, uh, some other publications. And then uh, I probably will be you know, speaking at uh, maybe the Vermont Historical Society or the Shelburne Museum of Vermont History and you know, telling the story. And, um, but I think you, know, you asked the question of what I hope to get out of the book. And I think it's a kind of revitalizing the interest in uh, this part of our history. And uh, you know, we're genetic products of mm -hmm. uh, the way this state was uh, created. And uh, I think it's important to important to appreciate that. And I really think this kind of history and understanding our roots and talking about them localizes us and uh, roots us in, uh, in a way that uh, maybe modern civilization doesn't. Once again, the author is David Holmes, and his new book is entitled On Being a Vermonter, The Rise and Fall of the Holmes Farm. Our thanks to UVM student producer Sarah Blow and the editor Aidan Seipke. Our next segment demonstrates two different scenarios and the impact of each one on water quality and the natural environment. We learn more from scientists at the Lake Champlain Sea Grant Institute. Lake Champlain is an extraordinary natural resource nestled between New York, Vermont, and Quebec. But the lake and its tributaries are being negatively affected by human activities on the land. Lake Champlain Sea Grant works to develop and share science-based information to improve the environment and economy of the Lake Champlain Basin. Rain falls on the land and does many good things, but can also cause problems. Mark Companion is a green infrastructure outreach professional with the Lake Champlain Sea Grant program at the University of Vermont. We all live in a watershed, which means that rain falls over many different types of surfaces on its way to streams, lakes, rivers, and eventually the ocean. Along its journey, that rain flows over many kinds of surfaces that include forests, manicured lawns, and even the built environment such as streets, driveways, and parking lots. Each of these different types of lands have different abilities to deal with the water. Let's look at rain events as a tale of two gutters. In our examples, rain flowing down each gutter has a different fate. In the first gutter, rain empties onto a lawn in a more natural system. 
The second gutter empties onto an impervious or waterproof surface, like a driveway or parking lot. In the lawn gutter system, rain can be soaked up by the soil, which acts similar to a sponge. And some soils are better at soaking up the rain than others. Vegetation slows down the rain, spreads it out, and filters it of debris and sediment. Taller vegetation does a much better job at filtering than does short vegetation like a manicured lawn. Thus, there's less pollution and water volume reaching our streams and lakes. This results in better water quality and improved ecosystem health. In our second tale, water flows from the roof gutter onto a driveway. The driveway, like other parts of our built environment, passes that flow of water on. This rainfall may be causing problems. Unlike in nature, our communities have impervious surfaces, such as driveways, streets, and parking lots that do not soak up rainwater very well. Rain flows very quickly over these surfaces, picking up debris and trash and plastic, as well as oil drippings and fluids from cars that do not get filtered out as they would in a natural system. These pollutants can cause algal blooms, which can close beaches and cause other problems for ecosystem health. The increased volume of the water flowing can also create scouring and erosion, which can jeopardize the health of streams and rivers. Lake Champlain is a natural treasure. We all have a part to play in protecting it through natural and human-made environments and the waters that drain to it now and into the future. This video was produced by Lake Champlain Sea Grant, a partnership among the University of Vermont, SUNY Plattsburgh, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. To learn more about Lake Champlain Sea Grant and to see other videos in this series, please visit our website. Our thanks to the Lake Champlain Sea Grant Institute. And once again, thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.